first speaker for today is going to teach us why and how to do just that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Stephen Lavrell. Hello, people of tomorrow. You're going to witness an experiment. Um, maybe I'll regret this. Because what you're seeing right now is what's happening between my ears. Okay, technically, this was quite challenging. We had rain, we had, well, new circumstances, so we adapted. And it permits me to share with you my passion, and that is understanding the mind, the power of the mind. So what you see here, and this is the easy part after the technological issues, is in real time a decomposition of the electrical activity of my brain. Right? You see these three electrodes, they're going up, being analyzed in the cloud, coming back and shared here. There's no safety net. Uh, where you see every line, one part of my mind's sometimes chaotic activity. So this is a very complex signal. And we have now mathematical tools to decompose that. Um, it's a little bit like listening to music. We can extract, this is the guitar, this is the piano, this is the lead singer. So here you see 120 components of my brain activity. And you see, <laughs> it's very um, active with artificial colors representing how excited I am, how my thoughts are jumping. Okay, what am I gonna do next? And thinking about things that just happened. This is the so-called monkey mind, okay? I think we all know this. Sometimes this continuous stream of consciousness just jumps from one idea, thought to another, a perception. Maybe we'll have some rain, we have emotions. And that can be a challenge, at least for me. It can keep me awake at night when I try to calm that monkey mind. And so today, this is the first time I do this. Normally, I have Buddhist monks or experts, and I put that on their head. I'm in a better position, but now it's me. So what you're supposed to see is the effect of meditation, OK? And I can talk, and I will show some slides. But in the end, you need to experience it. It's, again, like listening to music. I can talk about some. But it's way better to just have the experience here, of course, at Tomorrowland. So the monkey minds, I think you've seen the colors, a lot of red and yellow and green. So these jumping thoughts. Now I would like with you, we're going to do this together, just take a break. OK? For those who are sitting, that will be a bit easier. For those who are standing, you can do this anywhere, anytime. Just take a moment for yourself. We're all lucky to be here. And we'll do one thing that's focusing on our breath. So sit comfortably, be grateful, both feet on the ground. You can put your hands on your lap. Take a comfortable straight position. You can close your eyes. Just let you guide by my voice. The challenge is on me because you're seeing what's happening up there in my brain. And we're gonna focus on the breathing and probably, at least in my case, thoughts are gonna pop up. We'll just let them pass by, bring it back to the anchor of our breathing. All the time, we focus on the breathing. You're doing great, so here we go. No safety net for me. Just take a moment where we inhale through the mouth. Out through the mouth. You guys are doing great. You can put your hand on your belly. The inhale and the belly swell. Exhale, belly, belly.
not go out. Did you focus on the breathing? ideal lab conditions, but I hope you see that something changed, right, in that very complex, continuous stream of consciousness. You see the colors, the wild monkey, red, yellow, green, and then there's some kind of stability, despite the fact that I was thinking about many things here. It's blue. It's a little bit like calming the sea. Those electrical waves in my brain find some stability. So this is, and I must say I'm so happy, this for me first time on stage worked quite well and I thank all the technical people who made it possible. It illustrates the power of the mind. How we can all, and believe me, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And it's not just sitting under meditation cushion in Taylor, Lotus, whatever. The challenge is to, you know, do this the rest of the day. So you see my monkey mind is back, it's very active. Um, so we can switch to the PowerPoint presentation where, is this switching? Yes. So I'm a brain scientist, a neurologist with my team at University Hospital in Liège and now also in Canada where I spent most of the time and actually just flew in so there's a bit of jet lag here we've been for the past 25 years studying one of science's biggest mysteries our own mind, thoughts, perceptions, emotions and what you see there is somehow a summary of how we can map using neurotechnology, brain scans um, what's happening, even it remains, of course, uh, a mystery and it would be very arrogant to say I can explain consciousness, we have no theory, but we can translate what we do know and try to help people heal. Our area of expertise is people with severe traumatic brain damage who are in coma. I work in intensive care, neuro rehab, work with a number of partners um, here in Antwerp train them. You see how we now also have technology to stimulate that neuroplasticity. Those thousands of billions of connections that can be damaged. That's my job as a neurologist. And I try to push, stimulate that by neuromodulation. You see two electrodes. We've got many possibilities here. Neurorobotics helping patients. But today I would like to talk about our studies on meditation and that was completely new for me um, I during medical school and uh, specializing in neurology meditation wasn't mentioned if it was it was more like be careful and so it was as it often is I know that now as a physician because of a personal crisis in 2012 not give you the whole story, it's in the book, but um, went through a very, very stressful period. Um, I was 
alone with the three kids, painful separation. My daughter is here somewhere in the audience taking pictures. It was stressful for them too, of course. And they saw a dad that was obviously very stressed. I was drinking, smoking, taking sleeping pills, antidepressants. I wasn't the inspiring dad I wanted to be. And then on a TEDx, actually, in Paris, I met a wonderful person. Maybe some of you know him, Mathieu Ricard. He wrote wonderful books. He's a translator from the Dalai Lama. And he said, well, I can see you don't look great. Come with me on a retreat. And there a new world opened up for me. And I was so impressed that I invited him back to the lab. That's what you see here. And he was a super guinea pig. We put him in all our machines so that we could see with functional MRI and other machines what is the effect in those athletes of the mind? How does meditation change the structure of the brain? That's what you see here. You have his brain, we can look inside, and we see, depending on the exercise he's doing, because meditation is like sport, you can train those three networks, thoughts, perceptions, emotions. And then we see attention network in green, really changing its structure, just becoming bigger. But it's also about um, training your memory. In red, you see the hippocampus just increasing in size. It's about reconnecting and developing cognitive flexibility. This is a very important word. We did it today. We had to adapt. We should be there. It's raining. We are um, having a number of technical challenges, so it is what it is. We adapt to a changing reality. Cognitive flexibility and this part in blue, which is your insula, is a critical area there. And then, of course, meditation is also trying to be a better person, develop empathy, reconnect with your own emotions, those of others, and that's that prefrontal area in uh, yellow. So we see change in the gray matter, but also, and most importantly, in the connections. That's the power of the brain, those thousands of billions of synapses. And we can, again, map that. You see it here. Let's just focus on the red. That's the connections between the left and the right brain. And they just increase. There's more like highways between both sides of your brain when you do meditation. All right, but we do way more than that. We also have musicians coming to the lab. This is Alain Altinoglu, the director of the Brussels Opera. When he listens to music, as when you listen to music, it's like firework in your brain, right? What was to me very impressive is the effect of him just imagining his favorite piece of Beethoven. It was even more um, activity, connectivity, as you can see on the slide. We also look at the interaction between music and movement. That we had a great collaboration with Corinne Sombran. She wrote a book on that tradition from Mongolia, and we studied how cognitive trends impacts brain activity. You see her again in the lab, of course, I just have way more possibilities. So it's 250 electrodes, not just three. And for those interested, there's a wonderful movie made about that journey. And I play my own role in that movie, um, where uh, Cécile de France plays the role of Corinne. She was in my office where, um, in the movie together, so I was in France in front of Cécile. We also study medical hypnosis. We have thousands, tens of thousands of people who undergo surgery while they're awake, not anesthetized, but dissociated, absorbed, having a pleasant lifetime experience that they re-experience um, through mental imagery. And we use virtual reality, and there's a booth here. You can try that out. We work with different companies to try to make patients more comfortable through immersive virtual reality and hypnotic state. We work with athletes. And this is a great guy, Guillaume Neri. Again, I took him to the lab. He's the world champion of apnea diving. So he came into the machines, held his breath for seven, eight minutes. We were measuring what's going on inside, and it was very similar to what we saw in the Buddhist monks. But of course, you don't need to be a top athlete or a Buddhist monk. Believe me, I'm not a Zen master. I'm not a monk at all. And yet, it is possible to be attentive to your um, mental well-being. And that's what we try to do also in a big collaborative story with entrepreneurs. And we'll have some after um, with Christian um, sharing with us their challenges. And again, cognitive flexibility seemed to be the key word. We had hundreds of them. You may recognize some of these guys, manager, trend manager of the year, CEO of Icewatch, 
I like chocolate, so uh, if I see of uh, Chocolat Galère, we put some of them in the machine, we just publish results. So these guys know how to adapt when things are not going as planned. And they have a different activity, connectivity of this famous region, remember? Um, deep in the brain, the insula in blue, uh, with the prefrontal cortex, important for us to adapt to different conditions. We also saw that actually in the astronauts, we have a long-standing collaboration with the European Space Agency. I'm very proud because one of my PhD students is recently um, selected to go, not just to the International Space Station, there are seven guys up there, but to the moon, can you imagine? So we study their brains between, uh, before they take off, and when they come back, and of course that's very impressive how you need to adapt to a changing reality up there. And it's not just technology, it is also about your mindset um, and the power of the mind as here practiced by um, David uh, Saint-Jacques who is meditating upside down, there's no up there's no down. So this is my big message of this keynote. We'll have the discussion afterwards if you've got any question. But I want to share with you my passion. It's the power of the mind where I see my role now as a physician to ask patients to be more involved. We want quick fixes. People sometimes are disappointed when they don't leave my consultation or teleconsultation because I'm a lot of bra without a pill. I think it's very good. We have these pills and we have high tech, highly specialized medicine, but there's so much more we can do as citizens, as patients, um, and we can be not just through meditation empowered, but also through physical activity, the quality of our sleep, of our work environment, of our relationship. So enjoy your passion and take good care. Um, I wish you a wonderful festival. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can I ask you a naughty question? I'm going to ask you a naughty question because we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't rehearse this. What happens to the brain when you cuddle? <laughs> I'll tell you why I ask. So one of the fun things about working for Love Tomorrow is that you get to meet all these fun people. I am silently in love with Dr. Zach Bush. It's not a secret anymore. You know why? He's the best cuddler ever. So what Let's happens cuddle. to you? Yes, please. Let's all cuddle <laughs> for Zach Bush. Cuddling I is good really, for your brain. Isn't right? I mean, if the doctor says so, doctor's orders, we need to cuddle. Cuddle. <laughs> cuddle. I like to face someone. Look, look. You know, we're social animals, so we, we experience it during the lockdown. This is wonderful. Wonderful chemistry. Oh. But what actually happens when you are? <laughs> I can show you now. <laughs> this is this is again uh, um, a cascade of neurotransmitters. I think we need to avoid oversimplistic views, right? It's not just oxytocin, serotonin. It's like a firework with different chemicals, different networks interacting. Let's just enjoy the experience. That sounds like a perfect prelude for our next guest. Thank you very much, and see you later for the panel discussion. Wasn't that fun?